well, welcome everybody to today's session and thank you for joining us. My name is Jill Cabe and I take care of the community. And to introduce some of the Cashbox Global team, I'm going to just start quickly with Andrew, who is Head of Product, Chad, it's our operations, and Morning. Kim, everybody saying, um, managing all the admin. So she keeps all the lines straight for us. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, Cashbox Global is a financial services organization registered with the FSC in Mauritius. We provide global investors access to defined investment contracts with the same type of returns and capital protection, normally only available to large investors and institutions. And they come directly from some of Europe's strongest banks. We don't offer advice on investments and encourage investors to always do their own research. For anyone who's joining us for the first time, I just want to show you a quick little one minute video just to give you some context of where Cashbox um, fits in in terms of investing. Most investments only pay you when markets go up. Yet we know markets don't always go up, do they? What about an investment that pays you a positive return even in flat or falling markets? Introducing Cashbox Global Structured Notes. Paying out quarterly over 12% per annum locked in, even if the markets fall by up to 50%. Here's how. Traditional equity investments need markets to grow to generate a return. But we know the opposite can happen. Cashbox Global builds in deep levels of protection and locks in quarterly returns, provided the underlying shares have not fallen by more than 50% from when your investment started. Think of it as insurance for your investment. The minimum investment is 10,000 US dollars, pound sterling or euro on request, all linked to blue chip shares with returns only at risk if markets fall by more than 50%. Bridge the gap between retail and institutional investing. Speak to us today about Cashbox Global Structured Notes. So that's our, that's our elevator pitch. So if you want to know who and what we are, that's exactly what we do. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Andrew to introduce Tom for us. Hi, thanks, Joel. Morning, everybody, to wherever you may be sitting um, and sharing this, uh, this valuable time with us. Uh, very grateful for Tom to be with us today uh, on a number of scores. He's just come back from a holiday uh, in the Far East. He's busy moving home, and he's <laughs> rushed into the IDAD offices today to to uh, to be present on this uh, on this webinar. My pleasure. Um, yeah, thanks, Tom. So he's been a busy guy, and I think from the slideshow that he's going to take us through, you'll see how busy investment professionals have had to be this year. In the various webinars that I've presented this year, we've seen that they've been very very challenging times. Um, so the format of the of the show that Tom's going to take us through is a little bit of looking in the rearview mirror of what 2022 as a year has presented thus far in terms of the headwinds and challenges, et cetera. And perhaps to have Tom's view on the forward-looking expectations of what possibly could come along. There is some, some um, there are obviously a lot of challenges for the balance of 22 and into 23. Uh, Tom has been an, invest, an experienced investment professional over 30 years of industry. I think his forte and his niche is that he was? Uh, he has a huge passion for structured products and forward-looking strategies um, in terms of um, disruptive technologies. Uh, guru into this. I think the certain the funds he's running, the advice and the the, the help that he affords to IDAD certainly has stood in good stead. And I'm going to pretty much hand it over to Tom to take it away from now. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I think we've got some, I've got a deck of slides because um, pictures are always uh, very helpful to explain things. Um, that was my first holiday for, God, two and a bit years. Um, I don't know how COVID has affected everyone, but I found myself sort of chained to a desk. So actually, it was really nice to get away and clear my head. Um, and 
the uh, the exercise of having to come back and sort of explain what what uh, has happened in 2022 and and where I think things are going to head was actually very useful for me. So so it sort of let me you know frame my thoughts on on what's been going on and what I think might happen. Um, we do have some slides, um, and I'm hoping to see the slides in the sec reappear. Um, and um, don't be too scared uh, by the um, the title. I'll, I'll walk you through it, but um, I'm still. Are we having technical difficulties? Can you see them now? I can. Yes. I can see so far terrible and outlook not good. <laughs> So please stay with me, everyone. <laughs> no. Can we, um, okay, so I guess um, saying what has happened is, is always the easiest part, but it has been an extraordinary 2022. It's, um, you have to go back a long time before you saw falls in equity markets, bond markets, commodities, um, credit, um, just about everything's, you know, fallen this year. And the, the reason has been inflation. So inflation sort of broke yeah. out, broke out in um, following COVID when we had, initially it was sort of... No, this is actually just feedback. Yeah, it's not a CPR. I mean, a CPD. <laughs> so could you check if you could put them on mute? Um, sorry. Um <laughs> yeah, so um, serious inflation got in, into the system. I initially, it was sort of supply side driven. So, you know, we had factories shut around the world. We had, um, you know, uh, freight not moving, aircraft grounded. So you could you could understand how the supply chains got disrupted. And initially, it looked as if that was just going to be a temporary phenomena. And even even a year ago. Uh, only a year ago, the Federal Reserve were hammering on about the fact that this inflation was temporary, it was transient, it was going to pass. Uh, and and guess what? It didn't. It sort of crept into the system. We had the war in Europe between Russia and Ukraine driving commodity prices sky high. And COVID, the waves of COVID kept coming with different variants of the of, of the virus hitting and it got into the system. We had a lot of people retreating from labor markets. So there was high demand for skilled labor. So wages started going up. We had a scramble in, in the Western world for properties, driving property up and rental prices up. And, and into the system came inflation, which uh, is not a good thing. I think it's the greatest fear of all central banks is inflation getting into the system and you get into a nasty spiral of inflation on inflation on inflation. So since the beginning of the year, we've had central banks committed to stamping out inflation, stopping it from becoming structural um, and, and killing it. And it's it's been remarkably, uh, inflation really has got into the system. So. The more it's in the system, the more the central banks are committed to getting rid of it. And that's meant tightening in, uh, monetary policy, which effectively they do by raising interest rates. Now, the one thing that financial assets don't like is, um, is interest rates going up. So we've, we've seen quite a, a sharp sell off in equity markets and in bond markets and you know, a lot of the, so, you know, a lot of um, corporate debt's been hit hard. So it's been bad news. And it's, you know, it's in the system, central banks raising the interest rates. That, I mean, that's bad. But economically, what's also been happening is, particularly following the war in Europe, we've had elevated energy prices. And gas prices in Europe are, uh, you know, are sh shooting up astonishingly high. We just this morning um, in the UK, they announced uh, what the increase in October in fuel costs is going to be. We had a 40% increase in April. In October, there's going to be an 80% increase in fuel costs to all the households in the UK. So you can imagine we were already complaining and we've got an 80% pay rise coming in October. 
So there's the serious cost of living squeeze across the globe, very acute in Europe, very acute in the UK, and and you know and and hitting hard in in the US. We've got food cost of foods going up, and you know it's it's not good news. In China, where we'd hope for the the world economy to come back with Chinese factories firing again and and you know driving good flow across the world, they've they've adopted this zero COVID policy. So we've not even seen the engine of growth of the world, China, powering. Um, so you can pretty much understand why we've seen falls in the uh, equity markets across the world sufficient to take them into a bear market. Now, a bear market is defined as a 20% correction from the top. And that's what we've seen year to date in the US through to June, we entered a bear market. Now, the, the interesting thing about this bear market is um, it was, it's been driven by the valuation of the market falling, not the earnings of companies. So, so far, we've seen company earnings relatively stable. The fall in the markets has just been the valuation, what people are willing to pay for shares has come down. So, you know, it's been grim 2022 for understandable reasons. Um, next, next slide, please. So looking forward, and this is this is kind of when it gets interesting, there essentially there are three things that can happen in the global economy. And and forgive me for focusing on the US, but the US does lead most things. It's it's comfortably the largest economy. So I will I will look mainly at um at the US. There are three scenarios. The one uh soft landing would be this is what the Federal Reserve is in, in dream world is targeting. What I mean by this is um, they raise interest rates a bit, that gets the slack out of the economy, that brings inflation under control. And yes, we get a slowing down in the growth of the economy, but it sort of chugs along and, and we don't really slide into a recession. And do and you know what, guess what, next year they can start bringing interest rates down and, and, and we're back to the races. So that, that's a sort of ideal scenario. And, and that's what um, the markets would like. And, and a bit of the rally recently has been in, in the hope that that's coming. Um, at the bottom, stagflation is, is probably the nastiest of all. This is where you get inflation in the system that's just stuck in it. It's not going away. The central bank keep raising interest rates, but inflation still keeps coming at us. And you get a really nasty environment of rising interest rates, negative economic growth and inflation. That's that's a sort of run for the hill scenario. Um, but I think most likely to happen is, is the middle one. And I know it doesn't sound that cheery, but I think recession is coming. Um, if you um, there's a couple of charts there. One, the bottom one is is. It's a technical thing. It's when the um, the yield on short term debt goes higher than the yield on long term debt. It's called a yield curve inversion. And historically, it's been a very strong positive signal that a recession is coming. And that's exactly what we've seen in the US. We've seen the yield on two year treasuries go higher than the yield on 10 year treasuries. So if if you're ever watching Bloomberg or anything like that, and people talk about an inverted yield curve, that's what it means. Yield on shorter term debt is higher than yield on longer term debt. And that signals a, a recession is coming. And we've got that clear signal from the bond markets. The slide above is, is interesting. The, um, the, you can, the blue line is inflation, essentially. And the, and the sort of stripe bars uh, going down are periods of time when when the world's entered a, a recession. And, and what the chart is trying to show is that we typically, to get inflation down, you need a recession. So my hunch is what the Federal Reserve are not saying, because it would be political suicide for the Federal Reserve to actually say it, but they want a recession. They want to, you know, choke growth 
such that they can be sure that they get rid of inflation this time. So I'm sorry, folks. I think, you know, we've got a recession coming in the US. Um, could I have the next slide, please? Uh, and this this is essentially, the, you know, the the tug of war that the Federal Reserve have. They've got to get rid of inflation. They've got limited tools at their disposal. Pretty much the only one is um, is uh, in raising interest rates, because if you raise interest rates, it's the cost of borrowing, you know, goes up and it, it sort of controls uh, the consumer spending pattern. So consumers don't have much money to spend. And um, it's a blunt instrument for getting rid of inflation, but it, it's pretty much all the Federal Reserve have got. So with increasing monetary tightening comes increased chance of recession. You know, this is this is what is where we're heading. And they again, they can't really say it, but you you need a bit of slack in uh, the labor market to stop wage price inflation getting systemic. So actually, the Federal Reserve are targeting, you know, job losses. They can't say this, but but that they really are that serious about getting rid of inflation. It's the number one priority. So again, it's a tough job, but I think this is the way we're heading. In, incidentally, the Federal Reserve, they, they once a year, they all decamp all, all the different um, heads of Fed um, to a symposium, Jackson Hole Symposium, where they, they um, assemble their views and they come back with thoughts on the economy. And we're going to get that later today from Jay Powell and the Federal Reserve. So we get a bit more clarity. They won't probably say, you know, how bad things are going to go, but they will re reaffirm their commitment to um, to raising interest rates. Uh, next next slide, please. Now, I had to go back a long way to find a period in history where we had markets uh, falling as much as they did in the first half of this year and all the different asset classes falling, even gold fell in the first half of the year. And bizarrely enough, if you wander the clock back, it's 1981 that you come to. And in 1981, coincidentally, uh, we had central banks raising interest rates to fight the 1970s inflation. They tried unsuccessfully in the 70s to get rid of inflation. It hadn't worked. Works. They got a new chair in the Federal Reserve, a guy called Paul Volcker, who said, that's it, we're getting rid of inflation, come what may. Um, just prior to that, we'd had the oil price spiking higher by a war in the Middle East between Iran and Iraq. And the parallels with, you know, the Ukraine-Russia war and the spiking commodity prices, the parallels with the fight against inflation, the parallels with central banks raising interest rates is, is quite spooky. So I actually think we're following a sort of template of, of 1981. And what happened in 1981, I've kind of put a box around um, the, in, in the bottom graph, um, that's actually what happened in 1981. You can see the market fell, um, it rallied a bit, then it rallied where the red arrows were before it had another leg down. And um, initially, as has been the case this year, it was a sell-off due to valuations um, before latterly when the slowdown in the economy came, it was then company earnings that sold off and, and, and caused the next wave down. So I'm, I'm really sorry to say I sort of see a parallel to that period in time. We've had a little bit of a rally since June, but I think we, you know, we've potentially got another leg down. Um, so, uh, next slide, please. Again, this is, this is just a, um, a reiteration of what happened back in 1981 to 1982. The recession lasted from July 81 to November 1982. It was a severe recession. I'm not suggesting that. I think ours would be much more shallower. But what, what the central banks did achieve was they got inflation out of the system. 
And at that point, with inflation not in the system, they could start bringing interest rates down. That was good news for the bond markets. And then finally, the economy sort of got itself out of bottom and began rebounding strongly. And the equity markets, you know, started to rally. Um, so we took a lot of pain, but we came out sort of leaner, meaner, stronger as a result. There was also an interesting, it marked the, um, the introduction of the, um, the personal computer came in in the early 80s and that boosted productivity. And we also had what you need to get these sustainable bull markets is a, um, a demographic, a strong demographic of baby boomers. The baby boomers were, were coming of age. They were adopting the PC. And suddenly we had this wonderful period of economic growth. And we got a bull market that started in 1982. Um, next, next slide, please. Um, just to put this bull market into perspective, if you'd have timed it right and put $10,000 into the market, just in the Dow Jones, the big US index, at the bottom of that bear market, and then held it to the end of the bull market, that $10,000 was worth 14.2 million just in a Dow Jones index tracker. So that is the power of a bull market when it takes off. Um, am I suggesting that history is going to repeat itself and that your $10,000 is going to be worth 14.2 million in, in under 20 years? Not quite. Um, I'm certainly not saying that. A, I think uh, 1981 was a bit more of an amplified, amplified version of, of what we're in now. I think the recession was more severe and the rebound was greater. I think this one's going to be a softer version of that period in history. But um, there are a couple of spooky parallels. Um, it's not the PC at the moment. It's the fourth industrial revolution, and, and by which I mean We've got all these new technologies that are coinciding. We've got cloud computing, cybersecurity, um, advancement in biotechnology, ad advancement in electric vehicles, clean energy. All these new technologies are coinciding at the same time. And, and the, via the Internet of thing, Things, all these devices are talking. And I, I see a sort of productivity boom similar to the introduction of the home computer is coming into the world. And also, um, the millennials are moving as that sort of cohort in the age demographic through society, a bit like baby boomers did. So I see similar ingredients to what drove that massive bull market um, coming through. To get there, I think we've got to go through a bit more pain. We've got to see clarification that inflation has peaked. And we've already seen tentative signs of that. Already inflation data is rolling over. That's not going to mean the Federal Reserve ease up any anytime soon. They're going to continue to raise interest rates. But at some point next year, we'll get we'll get them uh, turning, pivoting. We'll probably get the Fed saying, do you know what? Rates have probably gone far enough. We're going to review the situation, but the next move might even be down. That's, that's an ingredient for... Um, you know, the markets to take off. We'll get the sign from the bond markets where yields come down. Bond markets tend to lead equity markets. We need that big engine firing China. And I think when um, Z, Z's up for re-election uh, in November, October, November, um, I think he will do something crazy like de declare victory over COVID and abandon the zero COVID policy and, and you know, claim his glory that he's the man that beat COVID. But I think we'll get the Chinese factories back, you know, driving growth towards the end of the year. And a lot of this assumes there's not a massive flare up in, um, in Ukraine versus Russia. And, and the signs are that's just going to be an old fashioned dogfight for land. But it seems to be not, you know, moving from the central stage. So I think there's good times coming. But I think there's patience is going to be needed. Um, however, you know, 
if you ask me whether I think markets will be higher in a year's time, I think the answer is likelihood is yes. If you ask me if I thought they were going to be higher in three years' time, I'd say very much so with a high degree of certainty. The great thing about buying a structured product is, um, do you know what? Um, having sort of one or two years when it, it doesn't pay out and doesn't breach its barrier and rolls up in coupons is, is no bad thing. Or if it's already generating coupons, it's no bad thing at all. Sometimes the annoyance with the structured product is, is you, you know, it calls and you get your money um, when, you know, it's set to drive a lovely income for a long time. So we're not quite there yet. Um, I think I've got one final slide, which is um, two things that make me think it's possible we're already in this bull market. It's possible. You know, I said that I thought we might get the sell off like we did. Um, when recession bit and earnings started falling. I still think we're going to get that, but, but often markets look through, look forward. They discount what's happening now. So it's possible the markets have already discounted all this bad news and that we're already there. And two reasons for that is, is the top chart where you can see the little circled red lines where the, the blue chart has fallen below zero. That means institutional investors, the majority of world um investors have are negative on equities that means they prefer bonds to equities and and actually that's if if you look at when it happened before it was in 09 which marked the beginning of the of the bull market it was in may 20 which marked the beginning of the bull market and it's actually happened now so it's possible um because everyone's positioned for armageddon that everything's already in the price you know, it's been a mean market this year, so it's possible we're already, um, you know, in in the start of a new bull market. And and the second chart at the bottom is the first trust went back and analysed every period where there'd been a fall of greater than fifteen percent in the first half of the year, uh, which are the orange bars negative. What happened for the remainder of the year, which are the blue bars? Um, and and on every occasion we got a positive second half of the year. So, you know, statistics, lies, damn lies, and statistics. Who knows? But both those um, both those charts suggest I could be wrong, and we're already in in the start of a bull market. Um, so hopefully I haven't scared you too much, and hopefully I've given you some reason for optimism. Um, I'll I'll pause there, and I guess. Any questions anywhere? Excellent. Uh, thanks so much, Tom. That was really, really interesting. So if you do have any questions, either you can pop them in the chat, alternatively ask away, and we're here to answer your questions. OK, so may, may I ask away? With pleasure. That was an excellent presentation. And it's nice to look at what history has done to how we can expect the future to be. I feel there's some different things that are happening now that didn't happen in the past, but I could be wrong. That's why I want your opinion. The, the, the whole situation now is to do with food security and energy security. And it seems like in a way, at least in Europe, uh, the actions they're taking can create uh, a very dire situation for both you know, with closing down of fertilizers or getting fertilizers in, and at the same time, closing down power stations and, and creating that shortage here in Europe, which is kind of different in my opinion to what may have happened in the past. So my thought is if there's something like that that does play out, which is what we are hearing that could happen, then, Corporations could actually struggle as well because if they if energy costs go up, consumers are going to spend less. So I just want to know your opinion because this is so here in our face right now that I was just wondering what is your opinion regarding this particular situation that's so different in my opinion, but I could be wrong, to what has happened in the past. Um, I mean, they say history doesn't repeat it rhymes 
and I think I think that's probably um, we're never going to get a perfect map from what happened there to what happened now. But actually, in the 1970s, um, you know, uh, energy price inflation, I'd suggest, was probably higher than it is now. I I don't know about food, but I know food price inflation was high then. It was it was pretty painful then. Um, and the, the food and energy um, security issue, again, is it does come down to price. Um, you know, if people pay more, they will get those goods. So I think it is the same sort of structural problem. And I know it feels incredibly acute at the moment. Um, but, you know, we do have new technologies coming on stream, not quick enough, but they will get there. All the, you know, the solar wind, etc. cetera. Um, the, you know, a lot of the, the Ukrainian ports have opened up again. So we are getting a lot of the um, agricultural commodities shipped out of Ukraine, not to the same degree. But I think the bottleneck on both of both energy and food will will ease. I mean, it feels incredibly acute and painful at the time, as I'm sure it probably did to people in the 1970s, and they thought it would never end. But, you know, there's an equilibrium the world finds, and it, that equilibrium is normally found through money and price. And, and supply moves, if, if price is high enough, supply moves to catch up. Um, you know, we, I mean, the world's almost, oh, I could, by the way, I can talk forever about various subjects. And the, I mean, the, the Republicans in the US at the moment are trying to ban ESG investment for, for um, you know, states, states can't go anywhere near um, ESG investment because they want money chucked back into old oil. Um, and, you know, you could get the rigs appearing and the fracking and the world will go backwards. I suspect it will be a bit of both. In the short term, we've got to go backward using a bit more nuclear and more oil. But long term, you know, these new technologies are coming on stream. We are going to, you know, give it 50 years and we've got free energy from the sun or very cheap energy from the sun. The cost of, um, you know, wind, electricity production from wind has come under gas for the first time ever. So we're getting there. Patience, I think. Can I Let's throw a question in? A question. Oh. I'll rather your opinion on another thing, which is to do with us baby boomers who were driving the market and asset prices up in those days. Baby boomers are now retiring, and, and so they are not there anymore to create that. But we've got the millennials, like you said, they're coming of age. What is your opinion with where the millennials are going? It seems like they're more into the crypto space and metaverse, and they're very happily invest lots of money on virtual land <laughs> and something more. So, yeah. And, and at the moment, that's those companies that create this blockchain products are not yet quite kind of in the equity market, you know, the traditional market. They're, they're literally a little bit separate. I know some some will probably start, you know, kind of going IPOs and sell, selling the shares and then us oldies can participate in that uh, because we believe in that market. But what is your opinion of how the millennials, I know there's new technology and everything, how will they kind of shift? I know they will shift for their generation, the situation. But I'm also talking about us retirees. Okay, well, the first thing is the millennials will still need houses and services and restaurants and, you know, basic goods. So, you know, that's not going away forever. They're not just going to live with their uh, VR headset on. But uh, your point is very valid. What you've talked about is the future of the world. And it's it's generationally going to be their future. So um, you've described where they're going to invest, because that's what the world's going to be looking like. We are going to have cloud computers, artificial intelligence, robotics, um, VR entertainment, online shopping, digital transactions, online banking. That is where the world's heading and that's where they will invest. Tom, can I ask a question? Sure. As a fund manager, um, I, I look at your graphs and I go, wow, there's probably a lot of opportunity that exists 
in all this turmoil, right? So yeah. um, perhaps outside of structured products, we'll chat about a fixed income one just now. Where do you see opportunities and how would you play this? Um, where's your mind at the moment? Well, I think um, Shemin, if I'm pronouncing it right, gave us the clue, um, hmm. exactly the clue. It's where will these millennials invest and what will the world look like? And the world is changing. Um, it really is. And we're moving into, um, you know, the, a whole new dimension where these new technologies, instead of being fringe things, they become absolutely structural parts of ways of life. So a bit like the PC arrived and everyone stared at it and didn't really know what it you know, did. And then, and then the mobile phone, you know, kind of came in and everyone went, oh, I'm not sure I can find a use for that, but I might. And then we had the internet and everyone said it's going to be amazing, but no one used it properly. Um, I think we've got the, um, the maturing of all these technologies coinciding. And, and that is very much where it's, it's going to drive. So, you know, long term investment should be in, um, you know, in a portfolio of all these new technologies, um, which sounds like you've given me the chance for a plug chat. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but no, I, I wholeheartedly believe that. And, and, you know, uh, we have launched a, a future wealth fund, which is is targeting, you know, all all the electric vehicles, the clean energy, the um, vertical agriculture, you know, things like that. The, the the food shortage, you know, if you start farming upwards as well as outwards, um, you know, there's some technologies where, believe it or not, you can get water out of air. You know, there's some extraordinary things happening. So. To so my mind, that's where you know excitement lies and long-term investment for the aggressive. But you know that's the that's the where you can make an awful lot of money over the longer term. But but obviously you need structured products and sensible investments as as core building blocks. Mm -hmm. And then my second question, it may take us back to a couple of the slides if you don't mind. With the interest rates coming down and the bull market starting to take off, was there a crossing point? It looks like it may be coming back. Does it need a certain amount of reduction of interest rate in order to try and accelerate? Um, or did it actually take off before rates came down? Correct. Absolutely. Um, I mean, remember that markets are forward-looking mechanisms. So when I started my talk, I said, you know, the, the market's fallen, but, but company earnings haven't fallen. You know? Yes, yes. And, and, and part of that is because everyone's gone, uh-oh, there's a slowdown coming, earnings are going to be hit. So the market sort of moved in anticipation of this bad news. And, and that's where it, jury's out. It might have moved far enough anticipating the bad news. Um, so when we, when we got the turnaround in um, 1982, interest rates were still really high and we were still in a recession. But the market kind of went, do you know what? Inflation's coming down. They won't keep raising interest rates forever. If I'm patient in six months' time, it's going to look good. So I might as well buy now when, when it seems terrible. So are you suggesting now's a good time to dollar cost average in? I, I think it'd be a fantastic time to dollar cost average in. Absolutely. Mm. Um, I mean, if you were trying to perfectly time the market, just at the moment when you're ripping up everything, cursing <laughs> the world and just about giving up on life is when you should invest. And it doesn't feel like we're getting, we're there yet, but listening today that an 80% increase in fuel costs, I mean, in energy costs in the UK, I mean, that's mind blowing. We, we, we had revolution with the 40% increase in April, six months later, an 80% increase. It's going to be costing people more than their mortgage, more than their rent. Sure. Scary. Yeah, really. Fascinating, Tom. Thank you. Excellent. Any other questions, Tom? Tom, I've just got a quick one, if I may. Um, it's sure, I, and, and I'm sure you've uh, I'm sure you've seen this in the press, but we've got uh, quite a quite a large investment bank, Citibank, that's uh, that's that's really speculating that actually inflation could achieve eighteen percent in the UK. Um, I know this. I know this is a UK question, but it's got a wider remit, obviously, because you know the whole world is uh, exposed to this inflation phenomena. So, 
in in that sense, um, you know, there's talk that that level of inflation needs an even stronger approach than we're seeing at the moment from central banks, that we could be looking at anywhere between 8 to 10% or even more in interest rates to really, really stem this, um, you know, ferocious level of inflation. I mean, it, at that, that sort of level, do you see interest rates achieving a catch-up to try and really, really kill this frightening level of inflation god that's all st terrifying stuff one um just hearing today about that 80 percent increase in fuel costs um it means city banks sort of crazy 18 19 percent inflation because if you think the energy the fuel cost component of the inflation calculation i don't know exactly what it is but if it's going up 80 percent then you you know the, the inflation numbers are are definitely into the teens in the UK. Um, the the um, how far you have to raise interest rates to kill inflation is is a good question. But I, do you know what I think? If 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 UK rates hit five or six percent in in the UK because we're such a mortgage dependent housing led country, um, that would soon just knock our property market it would knock everything so i don't think we'd we'd even have to get anywhere near double digits but mm. you know when i said 81 82 <laughs> was really painful and an amplified version it doesn't mean we can't end up there again at the moment it looks like just being a softer wave rather than an extreme wave but mm. volcker raised interest rates to 20 percent in the us to get rid of inflation um so we've got a precedent so you know, it could happen, Graham. Mm. Um, I mean, if by the way, if anyone else has any questions, just ping it into Cashbox, and, and they can find their way to me, and I can, you know, drop a line. Is there any more? Well, can I just jump in with one question? Um, if and, and I've been banging on about how corporate earnings in the states have, if we talk about the states again, have been really, you know, resilient. They, the quality companies have quality earnings. And those are the companies that one should really be targeting. Yeah. Um, do you think that some of those earnings are a little bit of a, there's a leads and lags? And that if we look at maybe quarter three and quarter four of the balance of this year, those earnings might actually deflate and therefore valuations come off. Clients have been asking, should I perhaps wait to maybe go in if the valuations are going to fall down even more with the sort of leads and lags approach? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually with you on that one. I think earnings are going to, I mean, the analyst expectations for earnings, they've, they've been bringing them down a bit, but I think we, we will probably get that lag effect where uh, earnings are going to disappoint. So if, if you think of a, of a market, um, the easiest way to value a market is a price to earnings ratio, a PE ratio. Um, so far, we've had earnings constant, but price has been coming down. That's what's driven the fall in the market so far this year. The next bit or the next leg down is where actually earnings fall. So the, the PE of the market, say, stays the same at 15 times PE. But if your E falls 10%, so company earnings are 10% less, the market will fall 10%. And I think that's what you know could well happen mm. short term. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Any other questions before we close? Chad's got some exciting stuff to tell us about our note that's just been launched. So if there aren't any other questions, I'm going to just reshare my screen again. Great stuff. Tom, thanks. It was fascinating. Um, and certainly, certainly space for growth. Um, if you if you if you if you pick up the clues that you were chatting about, so thank you very much for that. On something slightly different, um, Cashbox, and again, I'd add amazing stuff. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Graham. Um, we've got a fixed income that is underwritten by BBVA Bank. They are paying out a coupon um, just short of three percent per quarter. I mean, it's just phenomenal in this market to be getting 10.8 in sterling and 11.6 per annum potentially in USD, irrespective of where the market is. 
BBVA will be paying out this coupon. And the only time that the coupon could get interrupted or the flow of um, coupons interrupted is if all these shares, in this case, it's technology, uh, e-commerce based, uh, exactly what Tom was chatting about. Um, certainly, certainly a, a way forward, the, the world's moving this way, we're all doing everything online. Um, highly likely that these shares would then uh, not run to full term. It's a maximum of four years in this particular product with a minimum of one year. So we generate irrespective of where the markets are, the uh, roughly 11, 12% per annum um, until such time as the products or the underlyings are above their start price, in which case the product would order a call. So minimum of one year, maximum of four years, defined income stream, we could ride through all of this market um, unease at the moment for a defined income product. So this is lovely. The strikes next week, the or the week thereafter, the 6th of September. So we need to go quickly. Um, and then I think on the next slide, Joel has an invitation for those that might be new to structured notes. Uh, uh, Chad, sorry, Chad, just pre okay. Karen. So in the chat, we've put the link to the info session on this fixed in income product. Great. Great. Then see, we go into, we cover how it works, what it works, all that type of stuff. It's Thank also- you website but the link is in the chat okay so that's on the product and how it's structured and then for those that would like um, to understand and get more information on how structured notes work um, please reach out we'd love to take you through that and uh, there's a link to this session as well so education is a big part of what we do um, we've got investors from around the globe and we'd love to bring you into the fold if you were keen so thank you from my side Excellent. Well, I think I really enjoyed the session and I believe everybody else did as well. If you do have any other questions, you can just pop us a mail um, on support at cashbox.global. Obviously, our website and then um, take note of the links in the chat and then you can come through to the info session as well. Kim, do you have a question? I see you put your camera on. You're looking very glam. <laughs> No, no question. I was just going to say goodbye and thank you very much. That was so informative. It was amazing. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. You're welcome. Enjoy thank getting you. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Tom. Really You're welcome. My pleasure. Well done, Tom. Thank you very yeah. much. Thanks. Great. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.